just a quick note before we start. Um, I'm going to be having some live demos, and the code for all of them, as well as the slides and some other notes, are all in this GitHub repo. You can follow along or look at it later. There's nothing um, super special about my demos. It's basically just like you know a page of test code that I can show you the tool on. But you know, in case you want to look at it, you can see it right away. All right. So, hi everyone. My name is Christopher Beecham. My name is also Lady Red. I have two names right now. Um, I'm a senior engineer at Hitmonk, and this talks about Python debugging. Um, I'm going to be talking about three different tools: PuDB, Charles, and C profile. I, I don't know if you should call it PuDB or Pudba or whatever, but I've yeah, settled on that one as the most pronounceable. All right, so I write code, and I, this is like a little bit embarrassing, but my code is bugs. Does anyone else's code of bugs in it? Yeah. After this talk, you won't, you won't have any bugs, because you'll find them all. Anyway, no, not really. Here's some bugs. There's a lot of them. How many can you find? So debugging is something that you have to do. I mean, a lot of the talks that you know, maybe you've seen, it's like how to use this one library that you've never heard of before. But debugging is something that we've all done. We have to do it from the first day you start programming, because your first code has bugs in it. So why would anyone go to a talk about it? Well, um, what I want to show you is just some tools. The tools um, can help you find a bug faster. The faster you can find bugs, the faster we can fix them. I'm, just, I'm going to show you, walk you through all the different things the tools can do, so that you'll kind of know that it's there when you need to reach for it. You know, like just kind of showing you all the the tools on the wall in a wood shop, so you know I need a bandsaw. There it is. All right. So yeah, number one thing is it's hard to tell what a program's doing. When it's running, you know, you just see an, a little bit of line of output at the end, maybe a couple of log files. But usually, the, the complicated thing that's going wrong is somewhere buried deep in it. And it's hard to actually see that happening. Uh, debugging tools can make it visible. All right, so, the, so here's the, the three tools we'll cover. The first two will be in more detail. PuDB is an interactive visual debugger. It's very similar to PDB uh, and IPDB, other Python debuggers. Um, the second one's called Charles Proxy, which is not related to Python at all. I just love it because it's for web stuff. Um, it's a web debugging proxy. And then the last one is C profile. And uh, just talk about profiling in general and different tools. Uh, if you take one thing away, stop using print statements. They have a lot of problems. Number one, you're never going to just use one. You think you will, and then you're like, oh, that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the problem. Keep, keep on putting them in. Pretty soon, you're going to have to delete all of these ones. And if you forget one, all of a sudden, your print statement is in production. That's never happened to anyone. Anyway, so different people debug in different ways. You, my friend told me he just thinks really, really hard and then spots the bug in one go. That doesn't always work for me. Here's another way you can do it. Uh, I told this to a junior developer in my company. First, test to see if it works. If that doesn't work, try and like, logically bisect the problem in the middle. Like, take a guess as to where the bug is. Look there. You know, if you can see that you have to kind of go through and check your assumptions, your assumption is that all of your code should work, right? Because like, otherwise, you wouldn't be ready to test it. But something about your assumption is wrong. So you can kind of just keep on checking and spotting places to figure out where your assumption is, doesn't match reality. And here it is. There's the bug. Um, all right, so who here has used a debugger? Yeah, OK. Oh, a lot of hands. All right, well, everyone knows how to use one. That's fantastic. Um, uh, there's like the PyCharm debugger, PuDB, IPDB. Anyway, we've got a lot. This one's PuDB. It's my favorite. It's got this beautiful store or the display that maybe we've remembered from like grocery store <laughs> checkout counters like 10 years ago. Um, it's called NCurses. And I love it because it really shows you, it takes over your terminal and it shows you everything that's happening. So here's a screenshot of it. There's going to be a lot of screenshots. Um, and what do we have? We have a lot of blue shit and it's hard to tell what's going on. All right. If you, if you get confused, push question mark. There's a help, tells you all the commands. Um, Here's the code. You can see, um, you can see uh, like, this red line's a breakpoint. When you're using it, you also see a green 
line and a blue line, that's where you're selected and where the code's currently running. The code is like paused at a certain point here and you can step through it, but you can also read all the code, which is a frustration I have with PDB is it's just like, you're kind of like an IPython, but you're in some line of your code and it's hard to tell. Here you can see it all. This tells you all the variables that are in scope um, and you can like put type information or print or string or wrapper or whatever you want to do on these. Um, you can also set these watch statements, the thing at the top, that's like some Python expression. No, that's not me. That's someone else. You can write a custom Python expression that'll evaluate at every step and show you, um, show you its value, which is really helpful when you're looking for like a certain edge case. So here I'm doing, here's the stack. Um, I hope everyone knows what, the, what a call stack is, functions that call each other, and they kind of like are nested within each other you can uh, go up and down the call stack uh, and look at problems and look at variables that are in scope at any point. You can set breakpoints. These breakpoints can have conditions. Um, so you can be like, go, scroll to a line and say, I want to break here. Length of this thing is greater than whatever. So that's very useful. I, I also will sometimes do it by making, writing an if statement and then putting the, the breakpoint there. There's a, uh, uh, you guys, it looks kind of a little bit off. All right, sorry. Um, yeah, there's a little terminal here, but you can also break out to a real terminal. Like, you can, you can get IPython. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just do a little bit in it so you can see. Can someone hold my mic while I do it? Thanks. How's the speed? Am I talking too quick? Can people understand me? Cool. Could you hold the mic to my face? Oh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, oh my god, live demos. It's a terrible thing already. <sighs> so I'm just going to show you debugging a problem I had while I was preparing one, uh, some of the demo code. And I thought, I'll just save this de uh, bug and I'll debug it live. So um, what we're looking at is, this is a, who knows the Unix uh, command fortune? Yeah, it tells you like a fun little joke that's saved in some file somewhere hidden deep in Unix. Well, I think that's cool, but it's the web, it's the 2017, now it should be a web server. So I wrote a, a Python web server that serves up fortunes. And this job is, it needs to find the fortunes from a file, and there's something wrong with it. So the, it, the fortunes that are coming out, let's see, I'll just push continue. The fortunes that come out of this are really long. So let's see what the problem could be. This up here is running, is running the web server, and I have already put in this PDB line. That's how you invoke it. It's basically the same as PDB, except you uh, just put a U in there. All right. Um, so you can kind of step through here, and you can see over here, each time I, I push N for next line, the, all the, diff the variables are changing. See? Uh, let's see. There's another change, and you can you can come in here, and maybe I think the problem is actually, let's, if I can look, break out to my terminal, all fortunes. Oh boy. They're already too long. So the problem's not in this function, it's what it's already called. So let's step into here and see what's going on. I just wasn't able to step into a, a function that's being called and I can, that's like a smaller case of the fact that I can just go up and down the stack. So here's the stack. I can go up, 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 up. Now I'm all the way up in Flask somewhere. And I can go all the way down. And I can like check to see variables that are in scope at any point and like push continue or next line, whatever. All the stuff, it works at any point. Let's go all the way back down. Okay. So we'll step through this thing and we'll read what it's saying. For each line, it's going through this accumulator and appending it, unless it's the separator line. When is uh, so we can see that the line is this, there's a the separator. Let's see what happens. Okay, we append it, and then, and now I'm able to look over here. I can say like len, set that, and I'll set another one, len. 
Sometimes it's, uh, huh, oh, current fortune. Okay, so it's 10, but it just started. So I should expect that to be zero at this point. And then that's my bug. My bug is that I was supposed to clear out the, the accumulator when I append it. Um, anyway, uh, how are we doing on time? Do I have time for another one, or is it Charles? I have time? I'll do another one. If, if anyone has any questions during this, um, go ahead and shout them out about like what it can do. This is the demo portion of it. Anyone have any questions about this tool? Or All right, we'll just shout them out if you have them. Um, here I'm debugging a quick sort algorithm that I wrote. This was a real bug that I wrote while trying to write a quick sort algorithm for uh, the profiling part, which was a little bit embarrassing because I thought at this point in my career I could write a sort. You never know. All right, bugs will get you at any, at any stop. So let's see. I'm quick sorting this array right here. Um, and I mean, this is, I think I remember what the problem was. So, good God, it's hard to debug and think on stage. Anyway, um, what did I want to show about this? Oh, yeah. So, I, if I want to just like go to a certain line, like maybe I just want to go to this line, I don't want to like step through each one, I can just jump to that line and that'll just run the program until it hits that point. That's a letter T. Here's the, all, the, all the options. You're not going to remember any of this but, these buttons, but they're all right here. Um, it's a lot like PDB, except you get to see everything, so it's straight up better. Um, one thing you might run into this is you need to have standard out to in order to see this. So you can uh, you can go into like your test file or whatever, and uh, if your test captures standard out, that's a problem. You have to figure that out. But I managed to get mine to not do it. Okay, let's go back to the next part. Thanks. Uh, oh, boop, boom, fortune. That's what it was. All right. Um, so yeah, one thing I, d I didn't demo, but you can do this. You can use this while debugging your tests, and you can start in the test, and you can step into the function under test, figure out what's going wrong, see what, you know, where your assumptions are wrong, and then go back up to your test. Uh, you can also use it. You can throw it in, and then it'll catch exceptions for you, and it'll tell you the stack, you know, the stack trace, and you can also like go up the stack trace and check out what was in scope and you know how you got there? I just uh, yeah, and you can also set nose testing to automatically if you use nose testing to to start fit. All right, <sighs> that's PuDB. I put this slide in here to take a breath because now we're totally changing to talk about Charles. Also, it's a little play because the logo of Charles is a pretty fancy jug. All right. Who here has used one of these tools? Okay, so we've all used some, we've all had a problem that was related to the web and what is it doing. So Charles is yet another, maybe you'll like it. Okay, it's a web debugging proxy, which means it's a proxy that runs on your computer and you can pass traffic through it and it'll show you what that traffic is. And you can also mess with it. Here's something from, stole from their website. Um, this, here's what I can do. And let's see. So normally, when you're talking to a server, and it's 2017, you always use HTTPS, because only insecure people like, uh, would not use that. Um, and that means that no one should be able to, to look at the traffic um, between you and the server. It should be encrypted. So Charles, in order to show you that, needs to man in the middle you, which is normally uh, you know, a vicious attack. However, here, it's your friend, so you have to kind of work around it. You, might, you have to, when you install Charles, like, do a little bit of work to convince your computer that Charles is a friend. You have to accept it through your certificate. Uh, and your, your browser, you know. Usually, once you accept the certificate, you'll, get, you'll not have problems. But it, that's what it's doing. So the server thinks it's talking to Charles. It doesn't know um, that you're not actually Charles. But when your website goes to the server, it says, hey, how come this is Charles and not Google.com, production.com? Um, and then uh, that you, gotta, you have to do a little bit of steps. Charles makes it easy, but you have, to, you have to run into that. All right. So I guess um, for my demo for Charles, 
um, I took Fortune, my Fortune server, which was fine, and I realized that it wasn't actually fine because it was a monolith. Uh, <laughs> what it actually needs to be is microservices. So I wrote three or four different microservices that all talk to each other. Um, to sort of one of them does server-side rendering, one of them does fetching from a, from a third-party API. I don't know. This is a lot like my um, microservice architecture, which can sometimes be very frustrating because they're all chattering amongst each other, and you often just want to just do one. So here, here they all are talking to each other, and you can see they're all on my computer, and I made them all talk through Charles. Um, I mean, just the system proxy configuration did that, and you can see that. Uh, there's, it's fetching and then it's calling out to an external API, mixcope.com. That's a Fortune API that I run. Um, and you can see information, that, like this stuff right here is already super useful. Connection speed, request speed, all this shit. That, there can be a problem anywhere in there. Let's see. You can see the request and response. Um, you can see it. So here you can see HTML. If it was JSON, protobufs, if it was XML, it'll show you that in, in a SOAP. It'll show you that all in like kind of a native, like a format that it looks like it understands it. Like it can kind of nest JSON, nest, nest XML. It can read protobuf definition things and show you what that is. Um, here's, it can do with the little chart and tell you timing information. That's really useful. Um, I found out that one of our providers was throttling us by looking at this. Um, it's a sequence view, so it can tell you the order that it happens. Before, it's using a kind of this like folder view, which is really useful for finding a specific thing, but not for knowing the ordering. Um, yeah, I guess here I'm showing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Um, so one thing I often have is one of my microservices isn't behaving. It's having these 500s. Um, and I'm trying to fix it. You know, This is all my local environment. Um, however, to get to this microservice, I have to convince a couple other microservices that they need to call it. And there's caching in between. There's all sorts of whatever. But all I want to do is just hit this one thing. I want to have an up arrow. You know, I want to be able to just like do it again. So you can just repeat it here. You could also get a curl request if you want to repeat it in the command line. Uh, and so I use this. This is maybe the number one thing I use it for. You can um, see that here. I'm repeating it a lot of times. And eventually, it starts working as I um, fix it. These are different. If bomb is 500, uh, 404, timeout, different ones. Let's see. If you record information, you can save it. Uh, you can send it as a bug report to um, someone internally. That's super useful. You know, it, it makes redoing your particularly weird, you know, call after a call inside of something else. A snap, you can just click repeat and, and redo it. Um, and you can also send it to partners if, uh, <laughs> if you're having a problem with them. Um, all right, let's talk about other things you can do with it. Um, here you can, uh, I'm showing that you can take, my, my Fortune API supports the O flag, which makes them offensive. And um, you can like go in and edit what these what the requests are. This is kind of like Postman, um, and you can. So I'm adding this uh, form field. Oh, it's true. Now I'm getting a sort of anti-Yankee fortune from that. So you can use it sort of like you're calling the API one way. You want to start calling it a different way. Start passing it flags, seeing how it looks. Just kind of this early exploration phase. Uh, and my, you know, find myself doing. You can do it without even using code. Um, what am I showing here? Oh, yeah, this is showing the JSON nesting. This is a different API that returns JSON. So you see how it's kind of returning it in like a little bit of a format that's nested. I help you. Yeah. I just, I'm just kind of showing you, throwing everything at the wall that this thing can do. Um, here you can tell it to uh, just hit something a lot of times. You can use this for load testing. I used it a little bit when I was trying to do profiling to just hit myself a whole bunch of times. And you can see here that I fetched a lot of fortunes. And actually, I think I was able to figure out that the speed was slowing down a little bit when I intentionally introduced the bug to profile later. Anyway, um, you can set breakpoints. So sometimes you have like a partner API that 
isn't returning what you think it will, or so you just want to like modify it, here we're getting into the modification things. You can set breakpoints that will um, stop you um, here. So here I um, was in the middle of editing a response um, to from the Fortune API. So in case the Fortune API is down or not returning what you want, you can start coming here and execute it so that your code doesn't actually rely on the external service. You can modify it and meddle it. You here, uh, oh yeah, here I have one of my services is failing. And that's ruining my workflow. OK, well, I can just rewrite it <laughs> so that whenever we call it, whatever it returns, it's a 200. And I, that's the fortune it returns. All right, start working again. Um, you know what? This kind of stuff, you're going to need it at some point. OK, I'm going to show some Charles. Thank you. Thanks. Here we got Charles. Sorry, in the back, I think it would be hard to see Charles. I can zoom in on it when we're. So let's see. I, I think I can zoom in. Command option eight. Hopefully that's more clear. Is that helping at all? Is anyone in the back even looking at the screen? OK. <laughs> um, so you can just see here's all. You get a chart. You can see, oh god, actually, I hate the zoom. Sorry about it. You can see this like flow chart. This is helpful in case someone's throttling you. It won't look like instant spikes. You can, there's all sorts of different features you can do. I forget exactly. Here's repeat. You can repeat it a bunch of times. That, um, you can save a session. You can open. A, you can send people other sessions, and then they can open it. Um, yeah, here's a bug report session. Someone can come in here and see what's going on. Bug report. You know, they can look and see exactly. You know, what was here's the request and response. You can look and see like, okay, what was the Oh, it just was a 400. That's not very helpful. What about this one? Why'd you ask it? You know, a lot of times this stuff, this information is like really useful. If someone just says it doesn't work. It's like, well, it works on my computer. But they can send you like, oh, it doesn't work when I pass the deprecated variable or whatever. Does anything? Have any, anyone have any questions they want to see specifically about Charles? They might do. Okay. Well. Um, Let's see, what else, what else are they having this do? Oh, I wanted to show it hitting a real API. So let's do that. You can also use it, um, there's a bunch of ways you can use it as a front end developer as well, if you want to just back, mock out the, the front end. So, um, or it's mock out the back end because it's not returning what you want. So I work at Hitmonk, and I often need to run a flight search and see what our API is doing. Oh boy, <laughs> that's really embarrassing. <laughs> so here we can see our API has a lot of weird stuff happening. Oh, well, you can come in here and see the way our, our search API works. Come in here, see contents. I blew up the font size really big, but normally this is more legible. But I don't know. I use this stuff all the time. Um, questions about it? OK. I'll go to the next thing then. Thanks. All right. Extra credit. Oh, yeah, extra credit. Um, you can publish a GIST if you want to send someone. You don't want to send the whole Charles file. Uh, I said this, you can view protocol buffs, XML, JSON, structured way, curl command. I said this all. Yeah. More extra credit. You can throttle if you want to mobile, model traffic to a mobile device. You can blacklist hosts to stop people, stop your things from talking to them. You can just see what websites hit. You know, you can just use it on, against your web browser and see, like, 
you know, look at other people's websites, see what's going on with them. Um, you can uh, you can even mock out an entire server uh, and just serve local files from a local folder. And if you want to start that process, you can mirror them to save them to a local folder, modify them, and then serve them back up. I don't know. There's a ton you can do with this. It is unfortunately not open source. It's Nagware. I'm not being compensated. I just think that it's cool. Anyway. OK. Now, a nice calm breath. Charles is gone. You can go back to not knowing about it. Moving on to profiling. <laughs> All right. So how many of you have had code that was slow? OK. Cool. That's good. Me too. How many of you used profiling at some point to identify why? OK, so we have some veterans. We have some people who haven't done it. Is anyone not sure what a profiler is? I want to get us all on the same page. OK, no problem. So a profiler is um, a, it's like another thread in your process that sleeps and it periodically wakes up and checks what the main thread's doing. And it's and it, you know, just kind of like spying on it. And it records a bunch of statistics about what's, what the main thread is doing. And then the statistics, when, you, when it tells you them, Hopefully, you can use them to understand that your main thread was spending too much time in something that it shouldn't have spent too much time in. So it's just a way to automatically gather really in-depth statistics about your program while it's running. An important thing is that it must be running in the conditions that you actually want to make fast. Because if you run it with just some demo code, and then um, you fix that, it won't necessarily fix the real problem. So that's an important note about profiling. All right, let's see. This is totally different than debugging in basically every way. Um, it's about making it faster instead of fixing a problem of being correct. Um, let's see. One of the troubles with profiling is you can't know what it ought to look like. Like, you, you can see what it is doing, but you can't tell if that's correct or not unless you know what it should look like. And getting a sense of like the different times things should take is kind of an art. It's kind of something that you, you have to spend time doing. I said that. Yeah, a lot of it is reading between the lines. Maybe you'll see that you're spending a lot of time in, um, like, in, in one function, and, but you don't know what the answer is. It won't tell you, oh, you could cache that, or oh, and, you know, instead of that, you, you're just calling it too much. It, a lot of it is trying to figure out like, what isn't there. Um, one of the best things it can doing. Oh yeah, here. All right. Yeah, I was gonna say always profile before making performance-related improvements, but I, I kind of decided that was a little bit too strong. If you profile before making performance-related improvements, it can keep you from wasting time, because a lot of the time, what you think is the problem is like not at all the problem, and the problem is that you're like just calling one stupid function over and over again and not caching the result, and you never even thought about that. So. You get a lot of surprises when doing this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the 99.9% .9 of your code that's already super fast is not helpful when you speed it up. Uh, yes, if you profile with fake data, you'll get fake results. So I wanted to tell you that there was a super awesome profiler tool, like the previous uh, two tools that you should use. But unfortunately, <sighs> Python's a little bit sad here. Um, there are some profiling tools, but the, a lot of them are sort of um, a lot of them are sort of pet projects, and they're not really production ready. You can't really just be like, "Oh, I profile my whole server, you know, and tell me what the one problem is." It, they, they, a lot of them take um, some fudging, or you know, you might have to write some custom code to sort of introduce the profiler and tell it when and where. So, just like it's it's a useful thing to do, but. Um, just know that going in. So the most, the profiler that I've sort of decided is the one I should tell you to use is C profile. It's built into the standard library, and it's got two formats, binary and human readable. Here's the human readable format. I'll tell you what's going on here, uh, even though I don't think you should use this format. Um, so we have the number of calls to the function right here, um, which range from one to uh, two million. The, number, the total time spent in there, the amount of time spent per call, and then the cumulative time, and then the, the uh, I guess it's per call again. Wait, what is that? Huh. Cumulative 
Yeah. But why is it per call twice? Hmm. For the total time and the request of course, and for the, I mean, the time is uh, including the request of course? No, just like, just yeah, including, oh, just, just including the function calls inside or not including the function calls inside? Oh, I see. Yeah, total time per call. Yeah. I mostly just look at cumulative time because um, I find that's help, most helpful to zero in on the problem. Um, however, one of my frustrations with this format, and that's why I don't think that you ought to use it, is because you have to know your code really well to understand, okay, like this is, this is a Q, um, something that was running different Q implementations against each other that I did in another PyCon workshop. And it's hard to tell, like, okay, this q.py82 takes two seconds cumulatively, and this q.py39 takes two seconds cumulatively. But does that mean that, like, this, like line three calls line four, you know? Or are these two, are these, are, this is four seconds together, or is it two seconds together? It's really hard to tell, because you have to have a mental model of all the, all the function calls in your whole program, and that's often very complicated. So, this is why there's visualizers. Visualizers often are very beautiful. There's three of them that I used to use for C profile. Um, this one's called Run Snake. This one's called um, Snake Viz, and this one's called PyProf to HTML. I don't recommend any of them at this point um, because I think that there's a better option. This one in particular I used to use, but does not support Python three. So, pretty much, it's a little bit end of life. This is what I recommend. Convert it. Uh, so the, pro the, the profilers from Python are mostly pet projects. What you should do is convert it into something that can be used by a real big boy profiler and called Q, Q cache grind or K cache grind. It's part of the Val grind sort of family of profiling tools. And this thing can handle a lot more and tell you more detailed information. So there's a lot happening here. I'll kind of just talk about what we're looking at in this screenshot. Unless I already did that, yeah. All right, so over here we've got basically the exact same thing as the um, human readable format uh, that would print out uh, from C Profiler, except this is like a list that you can sort and you can you can you know you interact with this as you'd expect to. And then over here we've got um, a graph of like what function calls. So I'm on start and start called draw, paint, and set pixel. And here's the relative amount of time that each of them took. And then you might see, like in this one, that they called their children, was called their children, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, it's very intuitive to like look here and be like, okay, you know, like the big ones are the problem. The small ones aren't the problem. Um, there's also, you can, there's a lot of different little windows that'll show you. Uh, but it will show you like the call graph here, which is also very helpful. And I haven't seen another profiler that did that. Um, okay, here's an example of um, a profiler. Um, someone at there was a PyCon workshop that I did, or PyBay workshop I did, a couple of days ago, and they and it was uh, testing out various Q, like you had to make write, write your own queues and different data structures and time them against each other. And I ran the profiler against it, and I realized. So run simulation, which is actually running the queues, is taking, let's see, wait. Is, we, or we've got um, these queue, queue functions, DQ, and, but we're only spending 7% of time in there, in queue, 7% of time. We're spending 23% of our time in just checking the date so we know when to exit this loop. But checking the date is a syscall, and that means that it can take a, a time that's based on the load of the operating system each time it calls out to the OS. And this is adding a lot of flexibility to what should be a benchmarking program. So I just made it, yeah. Um, yeah, so here you can see built-in method now. That's from date time. 23% of time spent in there. So I just made it check once every 1,000 times. So the fix to what it, this can help you find the problem, but it can't tell you the fix, you know? I decided it's okay to be sloppier with our dates, and that made built-in function now take 0 0.07. So much now I'm we're actually measuring our queues a little bit more accurately. There's still probably something else in here. No, I think these are all queue methods. Whatever. Anyway, so that 
just that optimization made the benchmarks perform twice as well. So we were spending a lot of time not actually benchmarking. Anyway, um, here I wanted to show you I wrote a quick sort and a bubble sort and tested them next to each other. And if you look at this profiler output, you can see that you can't even see quick sort. This is like with a thousand, a thousand items in an array. And yeah, bubble sort takes all of the time. 96% of the time is in bubble sort. Quick sort is in 1%. It doesn't even show up here. So it's, that's an example of like when it's telling you what you should already know. But yeah. Also, something about profilers, profile visualizers, is they tend to make really pretty pictures. So sometimes you can just take a moment. I don't know exactly what this is supposed to tell you, but it is beautiful. Maybe it's like the problem is on the, is on the computer chip. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, all right. This is just um, some notes. Here's how you install this. These are mostly for people who come and look at this later and want to actually use these tools. That's where you get that. And here's a blog post about how to do this weird magic to get QCache grind to look at Python profiles. Happy hunting. CV this one? Thanks. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Yes, in the back. Q crash kind works on Mac. <laughs> That's I think it's just a different like UI framework, but yeah. I was gonna tell you to use like Run Snake until like three days before this conference, and I started looking at it, and I looked at probably almost every single Python profiler tool on the market: VM Prof, PyProf to HTML, VProf. There's a lot of there's a lot of them, and a lot of them are very frustrating to use. Have you taken a look at uh, Flame Graphs for Python? Uh, that's the name of the project, is Flame Graphs? Um, flame Graphs are something that Brendan Gregg developed in order oh, to do. Oh, I know what a Flame Graph is, right, but the exactly. project name. So, so the thing is, so Brendan did a bunch of work to get um, stack traces out of the JVM. He actually got that in upstream JVM. So it's really easy to generate Flame Graphs for that, but it turns out there's two separate projects, uh, one by a guy named Evan, I forget his last name, but then Uber also came out with one where they're, um, uh, I, I don't know if they're actually extending the Python VM to spit out the stack frames that they need in order to be able to do um, the analysis or if they're just folding the data hmm. output in the way that Flame Graph needs, but hmm. they both look pretty viable at this point. And the cool thing about Flame Graphs is because of the way that the visualization works, like how it lays everything out in a horizontal manner according to the amount of time spent, yeah, and then it I've stacks up the call trace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might be something worth taking a look at. Yeah, some of the other profiler tools I was looking at, like one named, I think, a VProf, did flame graphs and also did, a, did like a line by line format. But I found that when I tried to run them against, like, some, like it was just like very frustrating to work them into my production thing. Whereas um, C profile, you can kind of uh, just like call C profile and then call your Python thing. Like, it'll it'll run it for you, and it mostly doesn't die as much. You know, just there's a, yeah, but you know, I recommend anyone who's doing profiling try out different tools. There's not like even this thing is like a little bit hacky that we can convert it to use someone else's system. You know, um, you're gonna have to try a couple of things to really get a good result. But yeah, yes. Oh, can you give us again the the URL for your slides? Yes, it is. Uh, so I'm I'm Mixscope like Microscope, and it's Mixscope GitHub uh, PyBay 2017. I'm curious if you've looked looked at any uh, memory profilers. Um, some of the ones I was looking at did have memory profiling, um, but I, to be honest, I don't know that much about them. I mean, I've never had a problem that was out of memory. I always have problems with speed. Um, I don't know why. Maybe just computers are big now. Mostly, I also don't deal with huge data issues. Um, so I can't speak to memory profiling that much. I, I know there are some memory profilers, but which one to recommend, I can't say. Anybody else? No. Thank you very much. Yeah.
I hope everyone gets at least one tool. Thank you.